Today, for our study, before we celebrate the Lord's Supper, our topic is the three looks of communion. And I'll invite you with me to bow your head as we pray moment, momentarily. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Sabbath. We can lay aside the cares of the week, the cares of the world, and be here in your presence, and especially this high Sabbath at the end of the first week of the new year to celebrate the communion. We pray for your special presence and blessing upon each of us. Guide our thoughts now as we study together. In Jesus' name, amen. The human eye is the second most complex organ in the body next to the brain. In fact, the eye begins to develop just two weeks after conception. And the human eye can operate at 100% capacity at any given moment, any time, without rest. You can be thankful for that. 80% of our memories come from our vision, what we have seen. And about half of the human brain is involved with sight, the things that we see. Color vision in humans depends on three light-sensitive proteins called opsins in the retina. And they take in three colors, red, blue, and green. And as the light waves go into your eye, those three colors are blended in your eye and in your brain to give you the rich palette of colors that we so much enjoy. Just as there are three optins in the brain, in the eye, so there are three looks in the communion service. And we're going to consider those three looks today. That's the topic of our study. And I invite you to take notes. I don't know if you brought a piece of paper. You brought a pad. You can take notes. Three looks of communion. Number one is the backward look. And I'll invite you to open your Bible here to 1 Corinthians 11. This is a familiar passage, usually read at the communion time. 1 Corinthians 11, we're going to read verses 23 through 26. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. The Bible says... Verse 23, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the, the what? You do show the Lord's death till he comes. So the communion service gives us a backward look. In the communion we look back. We look back to the cross. We look back to Calvary. Our scripture reading today came from Matthew 26, 27, verse 36. If you'd like to turn there. Little short verse. But so much is in this verse. Matthew 27, 36. You can mark that in your notes. The Bible says, and sitting down, they watched him there. We are sitting here today, most of us. And so as we are sitting down, let's watch the scene. We're going to go back in our imagination. We travel back to the place of the skull, Golgotha. And there, as we are on the top of Calvary, we see coming up the hill this large crowd of people. And in their midst is a muscular man from Africa, Simon of Cyrene, carrying a heavy wooden cross. And behind him is a man with a crown of thorns on his head and a blood-stained robe. And we recognize, of course, right away, this is Jesus. 
And when the crowd reaches the top of Golgotha, Simon, he drops that heavy cross. And I can see the soldiers grab Jesus and they strip him of his clothes, that bloodied robe. Because you see back then those that were crucified were crucified naked. And in a moment they have grabbed him and they've laid him out on the cross. And as we watch, we see a soldier step forward with a large hammer and some rusty spikes. And they place the spike right there in the, well, not quite in the palm, in the wrist. Because that would, they didn't want it to pull out. Right beside the nerve that would cause the most pain. And as the hammer goes up, we turn from the sight. And we can hear behind the first blow. It's kind of muffled because it's going through human flesh. The, the, the flesh of Jesus. And then we can hear more loudly now the echoes of the hammer blows as they're driving the spike into the, into the tree. We turn back and we see them holding down his other arm. And the hammer goes up to nail the other hand to the cross. And then they nail his feet. And there is the victim nailed to the cross. And in a moment, these men, they know what they're doing. They've done this to hundreds of people. They were efficient at nailing people to crosses. In a moment, they grabbed that cross and they lifted it with its nailed victim and dropped it violently into the hole. They couldn't care less the pain caused. They were soldiers. And the Bible says, sitting down, they watched him there. There's Jesus hanging on nails. That's what the communion service symbolizes. It points us back to the suffering, to the sacrifice, to the cross. And as we see Jesus hanging there, we see the blood running down his arms, running down his, his side, dripping off of his hands and dripping from his feet. The bleeding victim. The Bible tells us, sitting down, they watched him there. Who watched him? Well, at a distance, the disciples, they were watching. They didn't want to get too close. They were afraid. And they were heartbroken. Their master, they thought he was going to be the king of Israel. And there he is, nailed to the cross. The disciples are watching off at a distance. They're there, but not close. And closer still watching are the scribes and Pharisees. No doubt mocking and deriding Jesus. They hate him. But when the Bible says here, and sitting down they watched him there, who's that talking about? The clear word version says it was the soldiers. The executioners. Sitting down they watched him there. Sitting down... You're sitting down. You are with those soldiers. One of the executioners. I want you to imagine yourself sitting there with those soldiers because Jesus died for you. And as you look at your hands, as you're sitting there, you see his blood on your hands. You are guilty. It has to be that way. Because Jesus, the Bible tells us, is the Lamb of God. You read that in John 1, verse 29. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. You see, the Lamb dies for sin. Whose sin? My sin. Are you a sinner? Then if His blood is not on you, you have no hope. You are among the executioners. He died for you. Come back with me in your imagination, farther back beyond the cross. We go back for thousands of years. Lambs died for sin, to expiate sin. Imagine you had been living back in the Old Testament, and you have committed a sin, and you're burdened with the burden of guilt. And you know there's only one way to be freed from the burden of guilt. You have to bring a, a what? A lamb. So you go out of the camp, outside the camp, to where the flocks and herds are, and you go out to your flock, and you look for a lamb. And when you spot one, you go over and you begin to examine the lamb, because it has to be a perfect lamb. It's a symbol of Jesus. 
And as you're handling the lamb, examining the lamb, the mother presses close, I can imagine, bleating, wondering, why are you handling my baby? And when you're satisfied that this lamb is perfect, you tie up the mother so she stays there with the herd, and you put a rope on that lamb and you lead that lamb back toward the camp. And the lamb follows because that's the character of sheep. That's the nature of sheep. No question. And as you enter the camp, you're headed toward the sanctuary and everybody you pass knows you're a sinner. It's obvious. The fact that you have a lamb following and you're headed to the sanctuary, your neighbors know, your family knows, you are a sinner. You must have done something wrong. You're guilty. You can't hide it. Everyone you pass recognizes you're a sinner. And when you arrive there at the sanctuary gate, you enter the courtyard and you wait your turn because you're not the only sinner. There are other sinners lined up to have their sins forgiven through the blood of the sacrifice. And when it comes your turn at the altar, two priests meet you. One priest holds a bowl. The other, a knife. And you kneel there before the priest, before your lamb. You put both hands on top of that innocent animal and you confess that sin, whatever it is. You confess that upon the animal. Now, who has the burden of the guilt? The lamb. You've been freed from that burden of guilt. And as you rise to your feet, the next moment, the priest hands you a knife. And you know that the next step, you know what the next step is. You are the sinner. You are the one that's committed the sin, so you are the one that has to kill the lamb. And I can imagine, you know, you put the knife, it's a razor sharp knife, that's the way they had the knives back then. You put the knife at the edge of the throat, the other priest with the bowl is standing there holding the bowl under the throat, and with a quick movement of your hand, you slit the throat of the lamb. He hardly knows what's happening. Looking up at you in innocence, the lamb is innocent. You were the one guilty, but the lamb is now dying for your sin. And as you look down, you see blood on the knife, and there's blood on your hands. Blood on your hand. The blood of the lamb. Now we return to Calvary. Behold the lamb of God. That's Jesus. The Bible tells us in Zechariah 12, verse 10, if you'd like to turn back there with me from Matthew, Zechariah 12, verse 10. And you can mark these passages. Zechariah 12, verse 10, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. We need to go there to the cross and look upon the Lamb of God, Jesus, bleeding there, suffering there because of our sins. And sitting down, they watched him there. You're sitting there with the executioners. And as you look at your hands, you see there on your hands blood, the blood of the Lamb, Jesus' blood. The communion service points us back to the cross, back to the sacrifice. Desire of Ages says it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. We're doing that today. We're spending a thoughtful hour thinking back to the sacrifice. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones, 
The communion service does that for us. As we thus dwell upon His great sacrifice, what's those next two words? For us, for you, His blood on your hands. Our confidence in Him will be more constant, our love will be quickened, and we shall be more deeply imbued with His Spirit. When I see His blood on my hand... I want to stop sinning. Don't you? If we simply look at ourselves and the effects of sin upon ourselves, we never seem to have enough motivation to give up sin. But when we go there to Calvary and we see Jesus bleeding because of our sins, we want to stop sinning. Stop bringing pain to the heart of Jesus. Communion points us back. We look back to the cross, back to the sacrifice, back to the pain, back to the blood. The first look, the backward look, is a look of sorrow. Our hearts are broken as we see Jesus, the Lamb, suffering because of our sins. There's a second look that the communion service gives us, and that is an inward look. You read that from 1 Corinthians 11, verses 27 and 28, if you'd like to turn back there. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 and 28. I should have told you to leave your finger there. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 and 28 says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat of this bread, here we have it before us, and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man, what? What's it say? Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and let him eat, drink of that cup. So as we look back to the cross, we begin to see ourselves as sinners when we see the blood of Jesus flowing down his wrists and down his sides and we see his blood on our hands. We see that we're guilty and we begin to look at our hearts. The backward look enables us to see our true nature, our true sinfulness. Here in 1 Corinthians, turn to 2 Corinthians, the next book. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5 says, 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. What's the first two words? Examine who? It's easy to examine your neighbor, criticize him, or you're the lady beside you or in your department. But what's the Bible say? Examine who? Examine yourselves. Whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know you not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates? The Bible tells us, if you're taking notes, Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We need to look within to see our true condition. And it's only as we take the first look, the backward look to the cross, that we can have a clear view as we look within of who we really are, sinners. Revelation 3 tells us we need the ISAV. Let's go read the counsel for our church, the Laodicean church. Revelation chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Revelation 3, 17 and 18 says, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And what? Anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. We need the eye salve, right? It's when we look back to the cross, back to the bleeding victim, back to the Lamb of God, 
that we are given, as it were, divine x-ray vision to see within. To see our true nature, our true sinfulness. Psalms 139, 23, and 24 says, Search me, O God. Look within my heart. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. As we take the first look, the backward look, back to the cross, then our eyes are anointed so that we can see within those sins in our lives that we've been clinging to. We need to take that inward look. The first look, the backward look, is a look of sorrow as we see what sin cost Jesus. The second look, the inward look, as we look within, is a look of <laughs> discouragement. When we see our true nature, and if you're feeling like you're pretty good today, I don't do too bad, then you need some ISAB. You're a sinner. You have blood on your hands. The blood of Jesus. And you need to see your true condition in order to be remedied. When we take the inward look, we may see bitterness in our hearts towards somebody else. We might see as we look within jealousy in our hearts towards somebody else. As we look within, we may see pride in our life that we know doesn't belong there. It is as we take the inward look that some of us may need to make confession. We may need to kneel down and say, Lord, I'm sorry for my attitude. I'm sorry for my bitterness. We might need to even go to somebody here in the church and say, I've got a, a grudge against you, and I'm sorry. I've said some unkind words about you, and I want to apologize today. Isn't that appropriate for this service? We're going to have foot washing afterward. And don't, we recommend, don't find your favorite friend to wash feet with. Find that brother you don't get along with. Go to that brother that you've had bitterness in your heart toward and ask him to wash his feet. Make confession before God and before one another. Ladies, there's some lady you've been gossiping about. That's the one you ought to wash feet with. It is as we look within that confessions must be made. There's a third look that the communion gives to us, and that is, number three, the upward look. We read about that from Matthew 26, 29. If you'd like to turn there. Matthew 26, verse 29. This is in connection with the Lord's Supper, that last supper. Matthew 26, verse 29. Jesus says to his followers, But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until... Until when? Until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So as we partake of the communion service, we also see an upward look to the day when we will gather there with Jesus and together drink the fruit of the vine. Jesus says, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine until the day when you come and sit at my banquet table. He's looking forward to that banquet. How about you? Hello? The third look of communion is the upward look. We look up into heaven and we see there our Savior and our Mediator. Turn with me to Hebrews. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. This is your Savior. He's in glory, pleading His blood on your behalf. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. The Bible says... Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. Where is Jesus now? He's in the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. 
Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The one whose blood is on your hands is up in glory now, pleading his blood in your behalf. And the communion service points us upward to the day when Jesus will come back. Luke 21, verse 28, Jesus says, when you begin to see all these things come to pass, then do what? He says, then look up and lift up your heads. Why? For your redemption draws nigh. The communion service points us forward to the day when Jesus will come back and gather his elect and take us up to that banquet table in heaven where we're going to drink the fruit of the vine with our master. The first look, the backward look, is a look of sorrow. The second look, the inward look, can be a look of discouragement. But the third look, the upward look, is a look of hope. We see that Jesus is coming soon. We've been studying about that all this week. The signs, how to prepare for that event. The upward look is the look of hope. There is hope. There is hope for you. Amen? Amen. The communion service today gives us three looks. The first look is the backward look. We look back to the cross, back to the sacrifice. Jesus says, as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you remember my sacrifice. The second look is the inward look, and it's appropriate today to take an inward look before we partake of the communion service, to examine our hearts. Lord, is there some sin in my life? Because if I partake of the communion service and I've got unconfessed sin in my life, I've got bitterness in my heart, the Bible tells me I'm partaking of the Lord's body and blood to my own damnation. It's a solemn thing to partake of communion. If there's something I need to confess, I need to do that in the inward look. And then number three, the upward look, the look of hope. Someday soon, Jesus will come back. And there at that grand table in heaven, we will sit down with Jesus himself and drink of the fruit of the vine. I look forward to that, don't you? There is hope for you. Communion points us to the cross. There is hope for you. Christ there experienced pain and loss. There is hope for you. Jesus' blood cleanses from all draws. So there is hope in Christ for you. There is hope for you. Your soul can be cleansed from sin. There is hope for you. You can experience peace within. There is hope for you. Deliverance for you, Christ did win. So, there is hope in Christ for you. Today, as we end our worship service, we're going to take several minutes of prayer time, silent prayer, and we want at this point for each here to take the inward look. And as you look within, as you in silent prayer, ask God to search your heart. If God reveals something that you need to confess to him before we partake of the communion service, then do that as we have this time of silent prayer. If there is someone here that you know you need to make confession to, someone you've wronged, then after we have our prayer time and we are dismissed for the foot washing, I want to encourage you, go to that person and make amends, make confession, make it right. And then you can wash feet together and be prepared for the communion service. As far as we are able, let's kneel together We'll have several moments of silent prayer, and then when we hear the piano begin to play, that will be the indication that silent prayer is ended.
We'll have a general prayer and then announcements concerning the foot washing. Let's kneel as far as possible for several minutes of silent prayer.